welcome to this latest Original Thinkers podcast here at Alliance Manchester Business School. I'm Jim Pendrell, I'm Research Communications Lead here at the school. And today I'm delighted to be joined um, by Peter Buckley, who is the, you know, the AMBS's 200th anniversary chair in international business. Hello, and welcome. Thank Peter. you very much. Um, today's topic is multinationals, and I suppose more specifically, the fact that the the multinational model has been upended by uh, a number of factors in recent years: the rise of e-commerce, digitisation, platform economies, geopolitics. There's so much going on for multinationals, making it a very challenging and complex environment. And these are the things I want to touch on today with Peter, who is eminently uh, knowledgeable in these areas, has been studying them for many, many years. So looking forward to our discussion, Peter. Just first of all, Pete, just, just for the purposes of our audience, tell us just a little bit about your, back, your background, your research background. What, what areas have you been focusing on during your career? Well, I, I, I've been interested in, uh, I, I've trained as an e economist and my interest in economics has always been the sort of practical side. What can economics do for the world economy and the individuals in it and so on. So, so almost as soon as I got into the subject of economics, I was interested in multinational firms, what they can do and so on. I remember very early on having a, a lecture, a very interesting lecture on multinationals and development. And in a way, that's kind of been the core of what I've done ever since. I. After doing my first degree in economics, I was very interested in the application of economics. And the best way to do that was to do uh, development economics. So I did an MA in development economics. And then I worked on multinationals. And the best place to look at that was Ireland, because Ireland was developing at very early on. This is in the 70s developing by attracting multinationals in. So I started on that and I got very interested in the theory of multinationals. And I've always lived by the kind of mantra, there's nothing as practical as a good theory. So I spent a lot of my time on the theory of multinationals. And I think that's very relevant for a lot of the issues that you raise because there is so many changes and uh, basic issues, threatening, challenging, upending, as you put it, the, the, the multinational and, and the models that multinationals have for how they operate. So as the Chinese say, we live in very interesting times and the interesting times are the way, for me, the way that multinationals respond to changes in the world economy. And of course, the way that multinationals are creating these changes. So you have a very interesting uh, interaction between the strategies of multinationals, what they are trying to do, and the environment that they work in, which sometimes helps them and sometimes uh, goes against them. And there have been many significant changes that I know we're going to come on and talk about at the current time. And I think the way, my view of the way to approach them is to, is to have a good theoretical structure that can then look at the, the factors that impact on the way that multinationals behave and the way that managers in multinationals make decisions. Mm. Well, come on, you certainly come on to that. Uh, I think uh, you know, I, I mentioned in the sort of preamble that those challenges and those issues that, that multinationals face. Are there some which are bigger than others? Now, if you were to say, well, the greatest challenges at the moment for multinationals, is it possible to sort of just say there are particular issues that are most pressing for them? Or is it very complex and depend on well, the well, industry? Well, yeah, in, I, th I, think, I think you have to, <coughs> when, when you're looking at a situation like this, you have to kind of be selective and look at the, 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 the key issues. I, I think I would pick out three really important ones. The first one is the what we might call the fracture in the world economy. The fact that uh, there's a lot more protectionism, there's a division in the world economy between what we might call in quotes China and the West. I mean, we could unpack that and argue about that. So that's the first problem. The second problem is the uh, nature of operations in in most economies now is much more complex you have to have non-market strategies as well as 
uh, ordinary market strategies and that has to do with dealing with government and dealing with 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 civil society and the third challenge is the role of technology and particularly digital operation platform economy which are uh, technology both cr again created by multinationals and impacting on them that's really radically altering the structure of the world economy and the structure of operations and indeed the way that individual managers operate within multinational enterprises. Let's just let's unpick perhaps those three things in turn. Um, <clears throat> you're China, the West, US, um, you know, um, you've written quite a lot, a lot about China and multinationals in the West, haven't you, over the, over the years. How, what is your reading of the situation sort of at the moment from an economic point of view? I think the, 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 the key thing here is the interaction of politics and economics. Uh, you can never really separate the two, but I think sometimes we try and assume that the political world out there is unchanging, and you can't assume that because the 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 past ten years have seen some very radical changes. You you could argue that there's been there was up to about ten years ago a kind of glow uh, glow golden era uh, in, in multinational operation. Uh, even books published with titles like The World is Flat, as if you could operate. You never could. It was a myth. But, but the argument was that you could operate almost seamlessly across huge areas of the world economy. Nobody, I think, really makes that assumption now because of these political changes. And the, big, the biggest of them all, of course, is the fracture between... A, a Western camp and a, and a Chinese camp. And this has led to very uh, specific acts like the CHIPS Act, right, trying to protect um, um, tr uh, silicon chips and so on from being copied across this boundary and driving countries into one of the other camps. And part of this has been almost demonization of the other side and saying how, you know, how bad things are in China. Indeed, a lot of the things that are written about China, I don't necessarily recognize. So we've got this real fracture. Now, the problem comes about because in the golden era uh, and subsequently, global value chains have been very much that. They've had a very large regional element always but they, they, they have technically been able to spread the global value chain across the world. In other words, multinationals could look at all their activities and slice them up into different areas and then ask of each slice, where should this be located and how should we control it? Should we control it by internalizing it and manage it ourselves or by contract and contracting out? So we've had a big, big growth in outsourcing. And this has brought lots of countries into the global economy. It's brought in uh, originally countries starting with very low value added labor intensive activities and gradually moving up the, uh, the, the value added spectrum. And China's a great example of that. So China's no longer in many cases a cheap labor area it's a competitor for the u.s as and, and other advanced countries it's a leader in many areas solar panels electric cars oh, yeah. it's a massive uh, a, a, a massive leader so the, the 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 kind of integrated global economy uh has lots of lots of ramifications because if you've got a value chain that relies a lot on China and you're worried about the reaction of the US, it's not easy to immediately pull out of that and say, okay, we'll, 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 we'll move. It's, it's not that easy because you've got fixed capital, you've got, got long run contracts, you've got lots of these other things. And you can't immediately say, okay, let's pack up and move to Vietnam or whatever. A lot of companies have had for a long time a kind of China plus one strategy so they've built in this possibility but i think the fracture has caused a real uh, reappraisal and there are, there are certain sectors 
where it's now becoming very difficult to do business across this divide. The, the other thing that's happened in parallel to this that's very detrimental to kind of global operations is the splinternet, the breaking up of the internet, the great firewall of China started this off. So you haven't got the kind of universal infrastructure uh, and the mo move away also from rules-based activity, the sort of decline of the WTO and all that, means that you can't necessarily have all the rules in place that you would like. So the result of this is much more uncertainty, much more uh, having to question uh, issues that you took for granted in the past. Just one final point on the one before we come to the other two points. Um, you mentioned actually electric vehicles there in China and, and, and that's the interesting, if you like, sector, isn't it? Because of the, as you said, China has, you know, in so many ways stolen a march. They, they've, uh, you know, producing these vehicles, you know, uh, at a uh, slightly lower price to elsewhere. And, and there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the West sort of importing more electric vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting example, isn't it, of, okay, the relationship's very, still very strong. Uh, yeah, it, th that is, it, it is a really, I'm actually doing some, uh, some work on that at the moment. And, that is a really interesting question, a really interesting issue, and a fantastic illustration of how quickly things can change in international business. Because I remember being in China in the polluted days when you could hardly see across the road. And did we really take seriously the fact that China was going to put this colossal investment into green technology uh, and, and steal a march, really? in many ways go beyond the, the boundary that, that, that had been set before in terms of massive economies of scale, massive government subsidies, massive attention to, to key areas. Uh, is the very few countries that could have achieved this because of the scale and depth of, uh, of China. But yes, and, and uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic illustration of foreign investment and multinationals used to be what we did to them. Now they're doing it to us and we don't necessarily like all the results that are coming. With the, with the uh, reaction of, of, of protectionism against, uh, against electric vehicles and so on. Uh, there are there are lots of issues around the technology and so on, and is it really as green as it claims to be, and what about batteries and so on? So fascinating stuff, just uh, illustrating, you know, the importance of the industry. You know, we, 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 the, the yeah. industry and which industry we look at is really important. We've talked about chips, we've talked about cars. You know, if we were talking about the food industry or other things. There's whole lots of challenges that are to do to do with specific technologies and specific industries. Going back to your initial response to that my question, there's three areas. The second one was um, um, the pressures from civil society. Yeah. Multinational. Is it something you've written about? I know uh, extensively. Just briefly, what what do you mean by that? What, in, well, what, I, what I, we're talking about here. Yeah. What, when we when we look at what we've typically analyzed and typically gone into and typically been very knowledgeable about in international business we've really talked about two main areas one area is the market right how you compete how you set up your global value chains how you reach final customers how you do business uh, in a competitive environment and how you deal with new entrants and so on and how you put up barriers to entry the second area that we've been really uh, working on and worked on for years is the role of government. The word international, you know, you've got the national in there and the national often means national governments and their strategy. So right from, from its, its, its outset in sociology, economics and so on, the nation, the culture of the nation, the, the tariffs that, that, that protect the nation and, and, and other policies, have also been factored in. What I think it's fair to say has been less factored in is the role of civil society. In other words, what used to be called pressure groups and uh, groups in civil society that have an impact on multinationals, not necessarily through the market and not necessarily through government regulation. So things like uh, NGOs 
and, 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 and pressure groups of various kind, opinion groups. And multinationals have uh, had to discover uh, ways of dealing with this. And this often comes under the heading of, of non-market strategies. In other words, how you deal with, with social media and so on. And I had a conversation just last week about you know, social media officers chief social media officers in, in multinationals now becoming extremely important because you have to manage, you know, a, a whole, uh, one multinational, a whole team of uh, social media monitors, 24 yeah. hour going mm -hmm. through looking for mentions of the product, a uh, very well known uh, soft drink. And uh, so they, they are very acutely aware of how social media can affect both government action against multinationals and market, right? You lose your market because you regard it as being a product that isn't socially acceptable. You've got a real problem. So uh, it's, it's built up to what I call three vectors of power, which is government, market, and, and uh, civil society, social institutions, informal institutions, whatever you want to call them. A multinational's got a real balancing act. Now, the key thing here is you don't only have a balancing act in one country, you have a balancing act across different countries. Yeah. Now, you don't need me to tell you the difference between the social media reaction in a country like Nigeria and a, and a country like the US. They have very different perceptions of the same product, the same company, and so on. So managing that again is a, is a real, uh, mm -hmm. really important issue. And it's one that multinationals have to put resource into. So it's a costly activity mm -hmm. as well. It's not free. Before we talk about the third factor, which was dig digitization, which you yep. mentioned, uh, well, your point there sort of strikes the sort of the whole multinational model being, is it under threat? I mean, yeah, the, 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 you mentioned there, is it, are we head, going to be heading towards a state where Companies are far more based in one country. They don't, you know, they have different systems operations for one country. You know, they're not across the whole world. You know, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they have to sort of. Um, yeah, if if you if you're if you're meaning, can multinationals carry on the same way with the same model that they've had before? The answer is no. But if if you're saying are multinationals able to cope with this? I think the answer is yes. Because the, the, the model that, that multinationals have developed, the flexible uh, model of a mixture of ownership and contract, using the market, using these different strategies, uh, multinationals have proved to be extremely adaptive institutions. And I can see them having uh, difficulties. I mean, they've had to, the, 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 the thing that I noticed that multinationals are investing a lot more in, one is the social media side of thing that we've talked about, the, the non-market strategy. The other is risk management. Mm. Because one of the things that all, everything we've talked about means is higher levels of risk. And we've got this acronym VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and am ambiguity. And multinationals face all of those. But I, I think the, the, the kind of distributed model, they've got the globally integrated model, which doesn't mean owning everything. You don't have to own something to control it the way they can mix and match their different strategies and build in flexibility and introduce new strategies in response to these things means that multinationals are still uh, extremely viable, extremely important, extremely strong players in the world economy. And I think will continue to be so. They've taken hits, they've had to do it. But look at what's happened over the past 10 years. We've had COVID, we've had wars, we've had uh, <laughs> almost every problem you can think of. But multinationals, by and large, have sailed, uh, have sailed through it, not sailed through it unscathed. They've had to change. But that you don't see massive numbers of multinationals falling by the wayside. Uh, what, are you, know, sorry, I, what, what, what you mentioned the risks there, what, what are the 
in your 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 view the, the biggest risks? Well, I, th- I think of that sort of country by country sort of you know the more you know. You know. Yeah, I think the political risk and I think the political risk factor has gone up a lot because of of interventions and and uh, unpredictable interventions. If you if you have if you have a, a government in the US and, and, and to some extent is, let's take China as well, that is, that is relatively predictable, it might be getting tougher, but if you can predict it's getting tougher, you can put in strategies. The problem is when governments change strategies almost unannounced or very abruptly, China is not immune from this you know we tend to think we might think of this as being a trumpian kind of thing where you introduce random policies but look at what happened in china with covid one minute everybody's locked down the next minute they're not and and multinationals are are, are dealing with that uh, all the time Uh, uh, one of my favorite phrases is the two most uh, long-lasting secular institutions that we've invented are the nation state and the multinational uh, and you know back to the east india company and way beyond that into ancient history we've had multinationals so they, they are having to face costs they are having to adapt they are having to change strategy and individual managers will feel a lot of pain from this Let's talk about dig- digitization. You know, this is this is obviously almost cuts across everything, isn't it? Yes. Right at the moment, and the, yes. the speed of, of change. You know, the the speed of AI. We're seeing development at the moment. I mean, <laughs> where do we begin? But what what's it? If you sort of boil it down, what's it really mean for it, for the, for it, the it, 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 it's it's like almost any other change. It's these kind of threats and opportunities. Yeah. You know, the yeah. the threats are that you don't adapt to it, you don't see it coming, it comes out of left field, so to speak. It, it, it's, it's, it's something that, that is relatively unpredictable. The, the, the other thing about it though, again, is the, is the resilience factor, is the adaptation, and is the managing of it. And, and I think that the, 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 you know, the structure of multinationals is uh, it has been developing for a while, which is, and this is extremely crude, but I, I think I w- I'll go for it, that you internalize your knowledge intensive activity. So you keep a control of your knowledge and your intellectual property, you protect that, you invest in that, you disseminate that while protecting it. But operationally, maybe there are other people out there who can do it better than you can. And this, you know, this kind of model where you don't own fixed capital, where you don't own capital at all, you know, Uber doesn't own cars and this kind of thing, you, 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 you keep control of the platform and then you can outsource from that. Yeah. And with control of the pr- platform goes immense control of the whole system. So uh, it is evolving and I can see lots of industries uh, going that way. I mean, people used to talk about the virtual company where you're a knowledge based company, mm-hmm. and that's a bit extreme, but you can see the, the general trend. Yeah. And again, this is why, you know, I mean, a theoretical perspective on it really helps you to try and pull a lot of these things together that look very disparate. Mm. But actually, if you think about it, you know, the tasks of a a manager in a multinational of managing multinational operations uh, key questions where do we locate the activity and there's lots of choices and it's very difficult to decide and how do we manage the integration of these all this v- huge variety of activities that we've got going back to the platform economy because i think this is particularly interesting isn't it and, you know, we've seen these the, the models emerge and, and really accelerate the last few years yes. and and proper Companies being profitable on the back of it as well. You know, oh yeah, they're starting yeah. to really uh, get your profits. Um, do you think that really, if, if you pick sort of one trend, that that really is going to be really quite significant? Oh, I think it is, and I think years. you know when we you you mentioned artificial intelligence, and when you bring artificial intelligence in, then we've got some real questioning of a lot of the basic assumptions that we've made about how you make decisions and what the value of those decisions are. The other thing that's absolutely crucial that, uh, that, that is related to all these things is the role of information. 
you know, and is it reliable information with things like deep fakes and all the rest of it? We've really got some very significant challenges there about the veracity of the information on which you are making these crucial decisions. So it's kind of layered up. But if you look at if you look at recent events and the uh, the profitability of some of the potential profitability of some of these artificial intelligence things, you could almost argue it's distorting. It's got distorting effects because uh, we, we we often have these gold rushes in international business. You know, literally, the multinationals are involved in the gold rush, but you've got investment in, in up, over investment, excessive enthusiasm. And that's where we have to be careful with a lot of these, uh, uh, with a lot of these uh, things that are on the horizon. We have to be very careful that we're not, although these are very profound changes, we're not actually going over the top on them. And we are being mm. rational and keeping that in mind. Just one final question. Um, you mentioned at the beginning the importance of how managers themselves and executives are going to sort of change the nature of all channels themselves. They're going to play a role Absolutely. in defining what the skill set is of multinational no question, executive yeah. in next generation. Um, and obviously we're sat in a business school where you know, these, these things are extremely important. So uh, just again, as a final sort of four, you know, where to what, where might we see managers starting to really change the shape and nature of multinationals? Do you think? I think that's a really good question because I think I think the um, managers in multinationals, and I think that the, the idea was you entered a hierarchy and you went up the hierarchy and so on. Uh, organizations in in one sense, there's still hierarchy, but organizations in some sense are sort of flatter because you have to allow the manager who's closest to the decision to make that decision, especially given our points about the, the veracity of knowledge and can you be sure this is true knowledge. You need somebody on the ground really often in these in individual countries to be able to do that. So managers in subsidiaries are kind of, I would argue, more empowered than they've ever been. So I think the, 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 the new generation of uh, managers going into multinationals will have different attitudes. I mean, that, that, that's quite, quite clear. You know, they're much more socially concerned and social media's had a big impact on them and so on. They will have a very big uh, effort and I think they will be necessarily more empowered because they have to be given the, the, the more decentralized and uh, distributed nature of multinationals. You really want your what we might have previously called lower level managers to be really empowered to make the kind of decisions that only they can make because only they are subject to the, to the only they are uh, uh, have the available knowledge to do so. Yeah. So really, you know, the, 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 the top executives really got to put more, even ever more trust in in those those managers. Good to make word. Sure good word. Trust. There has to be trust within a, within a firm mm -hmm. to be able to do it. And one of the uh, one of the key features uh, that makes a multinational uh, such a strong and powerful institution is, is is trust throughout the company. If you've got that and you've got a purpose behind that trust, then you've got a very powerful institution. And I think if we look at the multinationals that have been successful over the years, you know, over a very long period of time, it is the ones where there is a coherence of purpose and uh, genuine trust so that you can empower employees to make the right kind of decision and, and, and feed that back. Well, I hope we've, it's fascinating. We could probably talk all, all morning, Peter. It's, uh, it's extremely, it's an interesting but very challenging time for multinationals, isn't it? That's, it is, that's it is. very, very clear. But at the same time, there are huge opportunities as well. So it's, oh, it's we're, the we're, international we're all, business throughout my career has been yeah. a fantastic yeah. subject. And, <laughs> and it could really what is that. need to be so as well. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I look forward to yeah, uh, this conversation, resuming another day, see, see how things have have moved on. But uh, meantime, thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you.